Morning, everybody. Dr. Jeller here again. Let's continue our talk uh, in spinal anatomy. It's week four. It's spring 2020. It is Wednesday. Here we go. So we were talking about the lumbar spine. We left off yesterday on ligamentum flavum. So let's pick up on ligamentum flavum. There it is, the vertebral bodies. This is an A to P view, but the vertebral bodies have been cut away so we can see the roof or the vertebral arch quite nicely, right? And there is ligamentum flavum, and it is called the yellow ligament because it has uh, some little bit of a yellow lastin fibers histologically placed within it. And yeah, its job in general is to join the lamina together, both sides. It's a double-sided ligament, so it's bilateral. You can see this would be the right one, this would be the left one, and you can see how it connects the two lamina together. And it's uh, pretty important for some stability. And we'll see what it does. In general, it's thick ligament. It's about five millimeters thick normally. In certain cases of spinal stenosis, it can become up to double that, 10, maybe even 15. It gets crazy thick in some people. It's a little bit thinner when you go up in the cervical region. It is a paired structure, as we said. There's a right and the left. A lot of times they blend together in the middle here. Let's see, did I, yep, I did this. So sometimes they kind of fuse together here. So they're not always a two-part ligament. And yeah, they're found uh, throughout the spine, even L5-S1, they're not found at S2, 3, 4, 5 in the sacrum. They're also not found between atlas and occiput. So C1, the top vertebrae and the base of the skull called occiput. Uh, there's something there, but it's not. Well, let's take a look at what's there. Uh, so no ligamentum flavum. Instead, there's a ligament called the posterior lanto-occipital membrane. So it's very, very wide. And it's a little bit thinner. And there's ligamentum flavum between C1 and C2. There's atlas. And there's axis. And there's ligamentum flavum. And that's it. Histologically, it changes enough where they call it something new. Remember, <clears throat> there's also an anterior atlanto-occipital membrane we talked about last time. So if you want to get specific about attachment sites, the upper half is attached to the anterior surface of the lower one half of the lamina of the bone above. And the lower, oh, and the, the inferior pedicle as well, the lower half is attached to the posterior surface of the upper portion of the lamina in the bone below. It's not attached to the pedicle. Importantly, it also covers the capsule of the zygapothecial joint or facet joint and to varying degrees, and we'll look at that when the time comes. So here's a P to A view of a motion segment. What's a motion segment? That's the functional unit of the spine, right? Assume you know that. That's the vertebrae above, the disc in between, and the vertebrae below. That's a motion segment. And here we can see kind of the general setup, and we see the inferior member of the motion segment. The superior portion of the lamina contains, we can see the fibers. Uh, but then they go on the inside, and they would be connected here, which we can't see. Right. And if we look from the opposite, this is an A to P view with the vertebral body removed and the pedicles cut. Just like that one picture we had, we can see how they're attached. That probably other picture, this picture. Where was it? That's a nicer picture. But that's the same thing this author is trying to, trying to say. Uh, but there is some uh, lateral and medial fibers. If you want to get specific, you can break it up into two fibers. Histologically, a little bit denser here in the medial part. I think that's getting a little too deep, though. Uh, the histology is very interesting of this ligament. There's a star, so I like this stuff. It's made up of collagen, like all ligaments are. 20% uh, only. What? 20%? How can a ligament... Yeah, uh, so, so elastin, 80% elastin, uh, so it's a really springy, stretchy lamina. Then it has this weird stuff, uh, this aluminum, almost like aluminum, aluminum, um, aluminum 
is in it. And that's a very interesting molecule because it has the ability to recoil. Most ligaments don't recoil when you stretch them, but this literally like a spring, if you like a slinky, if you pull a slinky apart and let go, it snaps together. And that's what this fiber has. And the fiber is mixed in with this, this other type of fiber. And yeah, so it's unique because it's made of yellow elastin, which gives it that color. And it's got that uh, aluminum, with, aluminum within it. Uh, and yeah, it has the ability to recoil. And because of its ability to recoil, one of its classic functions is to kind of assist when you bend forward, you stretch the ligamentum flavum. And then as you come back up to a standing position, you're bent forward touching your toes, it's thought to help a little bit kind of pull, pull your spine back up. Um, yeah, which is, which is interesting. Okay, it's commonly removed during a microdiscectomy. So if they have to, in order to get to the disc herniation, they have to remove ligamentum flavum. Uh, so that's common. No, Bogduk says no disability has ever been reported uh, in a patient who has ligamentum flavum removed. Uh, so anecdotally, things can get a little unstable, though, if you do too much. Um, but there are you have the interspinous ligaments, the intertransverse ligaments. You have other ligaments that can help stabilize. So it's not a huge deal if you have to remove it. Another important function, in fact, Kramer says this is the most important function of the ligament. Uh, it prevents it from buckling. Uh, so if you bend forward, the ligament may want to pinch forward, uh, but it doesn't. That elasticity helps it kind of suck in so it doesn't doesn't bend or buckle inward and cause a narrowing of the canal. Um, some people, when it degenerates, you can lose that functioning and it does buckle, buckle in and it can cause really bad central stenosis. Um, anything, well, it depends what area in the lumbar spine we're talking about. Uh, if you have a a median sagittal diameter of less than 13 millimeters, you're officially stenotic. Trouble doesn't usually start happening until you get down to around eight, seven, eight. And it has to be more than a couple levels. What's the, with stenosis? What's the problem? What's the clinical? I think I told you this. In, did I have you guys in first quarter? I might have told you already. What's the symptom the patient comes in with if you have two levels at eight millimeters of stenosis? The center of the vertebral canal is narrowed. The eagle sac is pinched. Claudication. Right, intermittent clonication. They say, Doc, God, man, I used to be able to walk, and now I walk for two blocks, and my legs are heavy and don't work, and they hurt, and it takes me a couple of days to get over that, and then I can walk, and the same thing happens. So remember, there's Vic and Nick, vascular intermittent, neuro, vascular intermittent neurogenic claudication, and neural, which is caused from, what's that caused from? What's Vic caused from? Clogging of the pipe. What pipe? And what's that called? It's the abdominal aorta gets all clogged up with gunk from atherosclerosis, right? And that's called peripheral arterial disease, PAD. Uh, okay, what else does ligamentum flavum do? Really importantly, it holds the capsule away from the inside of the Z-joint. Uh, the capsule can be pinched so if we look like if we look at a Z joint from overhead, superior articular process, inferior articular process, we'll just kind of cut it off there. But then we have a capsule, right? It's a real diarthroidal joint, so it has to have synovial fluid in it. Well, that capsule, and especially when degeneration occurs, when you're bending around, sometimes the capsule gets pulled inward like this, and it gets entrapped within the Z-joint, and that can cause horrible low back pain. But luckily, we have ligamentum flavum covering the outside of this, uh, and it's attached to the capsule, so it, it doesn't allow that to happen. I can't erase this program, um, but it won't let this get sucked in like that. So that's kind of the deal with that. 
Okay, uh, it resists uh, during flexion where we said that it resists excessive separation of the lamina. It kind of whole helps hold the lamina together with the capsule. And yeah, we talked about its elasticity as well. Avoids buckling. All right. Uh, getting deeper into the research, there's actually turns out there's three different types of ligamentum flavum, and we won't I won't get crazy deep into it. But one type only goes to about here and actually doesn't uh, cut. It doesn't cover the the Z joint very good. Another type goes about halfway, so it would be from here to here. And then the third. This is a picture of the third type. It actually goes all the way. Uh, to kind of the mouth, the proximal part of the intervertebral foramen, and that's type 3. So that's the most supportive. But if you get ligamentum flavum thickening, right, if this starts to get crazy big, you can start to crush nerve roots and things like that. I have clients that looks, ligamentum flavum looks like that, and thickle sac is all smashed up into a little ball here. And this is way, this picture shows way too much space here. 20 millimeters at the most, probably like 30 millimeters. All right, so that's the story with that. Interspinous ligaments. So they connect adjacent spinous processes together. There's also a supraspinous ligament. It's The interspinous ligament's really not that important, though, like they used to think. Uh, it's made of three separate fibers or bands. It has a ventral, middle, and dorsal uh, fibers, uh, which, yeah, the the ventral ones, uh, they have some connection with ligamentum flavum. Uh, so therefore, they do have a little elastic fiber in there. The middle ones are the major part of the, the ligament, and the dorsal ones blend in with the supraspinous ligament as well. Take a look. This is a lateral view, and you can see on the spinous processes here, Transverse processes here, it's been cut so you can see these articular pillars are here. There's a facet joint capsule, disc, vertebral bodies. Um, so the ligament on the top is called the supraspinous ligament, and that morphs into this interspinous ligament. Here's the kind of the ventral fibers here have more elastic fiber because they kind of like ligamentum flavum, but not nearly uh, as stretchy. Right, and there's the middle fibers are here, and the distal fibers, the dorsal fibers blend in with the supraspinous uh, ligament, which is right here. There's a posterior longitudinal ligament in this cartoon. Yeah. Uh, histology, so it's made of collagen, of course. Uh, we said the ventral portion has some elastic fiber mixed in with it. Kind of already covered that, but there it is officially. Uh, despite the classic teaching, these ligaments are really... Uh, not in a position to resist much flexion. Because if you go back to this picture, if he were to if he were to bend forward like this, you would think this would stretch tight and resist that flexion movement. But that's actually not uh, not the case, according to biomechanics and research and cadaver research. Uh, in fact, many of the collagen fibers don't even run, in a way to resist. See how this is drawn classically? In reality, many of the fibers are actually running like this, parallel to the spinous processes. Therefore, when you bend this for spinous process up, these just kind of elongate like an accordion. Um, so not like they used to think it was. So therefore, according to Bogdo, it doesn't really offer much help with regard to bending forward, which actually puts a little more importance on ligamentum flavum with regard to stability. Now, when we get up into the cervical spine, we have a little bit of a change. Uh, but some authors, so here's, let's, this is a median sagittal or mid sagittal cut right through the middle, right through the nose and belly button. Uh, we can see ligamentum flavum here. Remember, ligamentum flavum is the posterior atlanto-occipital membrane up here. Ligamentum flavum stops at L1 or uh, at atlas. Here's the interspinous ligament. There's also this crazy big ligament here called ligamentum nuke, 
which we'll study more when we get to the cervical spine. Um, yeah, but some authors believe that really this the supraspinous and interspinous, uh, it's just an extension of ligamentum nuke or considered the anterior part of ligamentum nuke. Uh, regardless, it's not very well developed. It's much thinner and wimpier in the cervical spine compared to the lumbar and thoracic spine. It's actually most developed, you want to get technical, in the thoracic spine. Superspinous, we kind of talked about that. That's the ligament running on top of the spinous processes. Uh, it's not well developed in the lumbar spine, which is the place you think you would need it the most because that's where most of the axial load is. Uh, but in fact, it hardly ever even crosses the L4-5, and it never crosses L5 to the first sacral tubercle. So you don't have it there. Only 5% of people have it between L4 and L5, so it peters out. Still have the interlaminar, or the intra, uh, the in, you still have the, um, the, intraspinous, the interspinous ligament down there. Um, but yeah, it doesn't, you don't see a supraspinous ligament there. It has three bands as well, if you really want to get technical, a middle, superficial, and deep. Uh, the deep ones are reinforced. That's not right. Deep ones are re reinforced by fibrous and multifidi. Now, I can't go up that high. Let me, that's not right. Let me fix 378. So just take that right out of there. Uh, but it is the deep ones are made by some of the fibers from longissimus thoracis. The middle ones are really made from fibers from the thracolumbar fascia. And therefore, Bogduk says it's not really a true ligament because it doesn't, have its own fiber. It's really made from tendons from other from other back muscles. Oh, that's correct. What was I was thinking, yeah, that's right. The deep one is made by multifidi fibers. Some of the fibers from the multifidi contribute that. Um, so that's right. Yeah, that's not an error. I'm going to undo that. All right. So therefore, it doesn't it doesn't have its own fiber. So it's really not its own ligament, according to Bogduke. What about the intertransverse ligament? Bogdu goes on and on about this ligament. Uh, it is a false ligament, and it's not really best described as a ligament. It's made of sheets of connective tissue, which which are seen in a coronal view or a P to A view. You can see them behind transverse processes. And un unlike other ligaments, they don't have a distinct medial or lateral border. They kind of morph into the muscle and fascia. Um, so it's really more like a trampoline formed by fascia than anything else. The collagen fibers that would make normal ligaments are not really there. They're, they're not densely packed together. They're kind of s more scattered out. So it's really more like a membrane or a fascia, according to Bogduke. Here's the classic type of uh, the, some of the fibers are thickest out here. Uh, but really, I mean, to draw it in, I've actually seen these interoperatively there's a procedure called a plf plf poster lateral fusion kind of an old school procedure uh, where they actually use this after they scrape the muscle off let's say you have a disc that's so destroyed it's causing so much pain you have to fuse these two motion segments together uh, you to do a fusion we'd have to go from the back side but you can remove multifidi from the back side, and you can lay ground up bone here, and you can mix it with BMP if you really want it to fuse, and this would extend over here. But you can try to do an intertransverse fusion, and you actually use this this ligament or this membrane for that purpose. So it does come in some some handy, uh, but it doesn't look like it's classically drawn here. It it does cover the whole thing, but it's more like a membrane. Its function, well, it separates the anterior and posterior muscular compartments of the lumbar spine. That's about its most important function. It uh, doesn't have much to do with stability. As I said, posterior lateral fusion, uh, spine surgeons can use it uh, to put bone graft material or whatever. There's a lot of different types. could be ground up hip bone. It could be cadaver bone. It could be synthetic bone. So all kinds of things they can use to make fusion. Uh, but yeah, they can make use of that. And here's actually kind of getting off topic, but here's an old patient. This is an old school 
posterior lateral fusion, or posterior interbody lumbar fusion, a PLIF, posterior lateral interbody fusion, with the old-fashioned titanium double barrel cages. Don't really see this much anymore. Most surgeons do a lift, the Tiger Woods surgery, or they do a T lift, transfer lumbar interbody fusion. Uh, but yeah, really nice X-rays. You can f the fusion material. Um, so they, the surgeon. Now we're looking at a P to A view. You can see the transverse process here. Some surgeons grind these down. They grind the ala of the sacrum down, and they pack bone material here, and try to get a little extra stabilization between the motion segments by using those intertransverse ligaments. Right, you can actually see a little bone formation. The surgeon looks like they did use a PLIF on, in addition to the PLIF. Anyway, digressing. All right, this is interesting stuff here. Accessory ligaments of the inner vertebral foramen. This is a, a, a rare cause, I would say, of based on my clinical experience, uh, but it can happen, of chronic radicular pain. And let's talk about these accessory ligaments. And Bogduke and Kramer are kind of split pathways. They describe these different ways. So which one's going to be on boards? Unfortunately, who knows? Uh, but I'll try to talk about both of them. Uh, so these accessory ligaments, the inner vertebral foramen, of course. Did I put a picture in here anywhere? There's the inner vertebral foramen, right? There's the motion segment. Remember the parts? So this is the inferior vertebral notch, superior vertebral notch. If this is L4, this is L5, we can say. There's the superior vertebral notch of L5 makes up kind of the floor of the pedicle or of the inner vertebral foramen or neural foramen, a.k.a. Inferior vertebral notch makes up the roof of this hole, this IVF. Right? So just kind of get our brains wrapped back around that. So, yeah, and much more complicated than, than Bogduke, Kramer even talk about. There's other uh, intraforaminal ligaments. They talk about the ones that are more toward the outside, uh, the more distal or extraforaminal ligaments, some authors call them. There's intraforaminal ligaments deeper within, closer to the epidural space, and there's ones that are almost communicating with the outside world. Those are extraforaminal ligaments. Uh, but they kind of use old school. Bo, even Bogduk uses really old research uh, to describe it. Uh, but anyway, here we go. Kramer actually seems to be really into this because he actually did a paper on this. I think it was 2012. Uh, so he seems to be into this. I'm kind of going to let him guide us on this. Uh, but yeah, so Kramer describes them as accessory ligaments. Bogduk uses, he calls them transforaminal ligaments as the main topic, and then, then subcategory, one of the subcategories is also transforaminal ligament. So that's not a great deal, right? So I think Kramer kind of used, invented this term, accessory ligaments, and I like it. Um, but yeah, so there's two types of accessory ligaments we're going to talk about. Both of them are crisscross the whole, the intervertebral foramen, in different ways. Not all, about half people have them, half people don't. Fortunately, I've never seen a study comparing the presence of these things with chronic sciatica. The problem is radiologists can't see them. They're not trained to look for them on MRI, and that's really hard if you don't have thin cuts on the MRI, and if you don't extend way far lateral, a lot of radiology centers cut off uh, before you even get to the things. So it's hard to see them. Uh, but in one study, about half of humans, 47%, had these things. <clears throat> Kramer's two subcategories of these accessory ligaments are transforaminal ligaments and corporal. What's corporal mean? Not a corporal in the army. No, corporal means body, so these connect to the vertebral body. Corporal transverse ligaments are the other set of these things. Uh, and so if you get pathology of these ligaments, like calcification, and they scar up and get thick, they can pinch the nerves that have to travel between them, uh, including not only including the, the spinal nerve root, 
Maybe you have a spinal nerve root that's embedded in the inner vertebral frame and it splits into its two components. So there's some studies on it entrapping the anterior rami or the ventral rami as well. And even the recurrent meningeal nerve or the sinus vertebral nerve, there's some cases of where that has been entrapped in here as well. Uh, so you can get CRPS type symptoms. In fact, my failed surgery, I'm a rare, uh, I had a rare case of CPRS2 following my failed, miserably failed microdiscectomy. And so, yeah, that's the mechanism of how <clears throat> that works. I probably have a real thick nest of these things, which the surgeon wasn't aware of. Anyway, try not to digress. Oh, so these anomalies or calcification can cause radicular pain and even radiculopathy. Now, I think I've talked about this, but I want to drive this point into your brains. Four stars here. The difference between radicular pain and radiculopathy. Because I hear professors using this wrong. I hear spine research using this wrong. And it drives me crazy. Radicular pain is an adjective. It's a symptom. Patient presents with radicular pain. That tells the reader that they have uh, some type of sensation, whether it be a burning pain or an electrical pain or a numbing pain, or maybe it's just a pins and needles of paresthesia. It's not even a pain. They have some sensation traveling or, or in their lower extremity. It doesn't have to travel from the butt to the thigh to the leg to the foot. Uh, they might show up with just foot pain or just leg pain or thigh pain and foot pain or leg pain and butt pain. It can be any combination of those things. That's radicular pain as long as it's semi-confined to a strip. If the entire leg, the circumference of the lower extremity, is in pain, that's not radicular pain. Uh, that's something else. could be pathological pain or could be a blood clot or something else. So <clears throat> you take a patient with a radicular pain and you do a neurological examination on them. You test their reflexes. You test their sensation with the little pizza cutter, which is called a Taylor pinwheel. And then you test their muscle strength to see a motor examination. If you find a deficit in the same leg that has this radiating pain, for example, if the reflex is weak compared to the good leg, or they have numbness in their S1 dermatome along the outside of their foot, or they have weakness of the gastrocnemius muscle, then you've just made a diagnosis called radiculopathy, right? And that's a, that's a real deal. These patients are in for a long haul. That's a serious diagnosis. Um, so don't mix those two up. Oh, the patient has, the patient has uh, radiculopathy down his leg. That makes you look not so smart. They have radicular pain down their leg. Okay, same thing. They have radicular pain down their arm. Uh, and you didn't learn a lot a neurological evaluation. You find a lost biceps reflex. Then they have radiculopathy as the diagnosis, probably from a disc herniation. Are we good with that? All right. So these transferminal ligaments, uh, they tend to be uh, in the lumbar and thoracic spine. Uh, they are considered normal structures. So just because you have it doesn't mean they're going to be a source of pain. We still haven't studied them enough to really understand them. There's also a huge variation from side to side. Some are huge, some are small, some are flat, some are round, some calcify. We looked at that already. So here is a uh, more modern research journal which shows more than Bogduk does and more than Kramer does. Uh, Kramer and Bogduk both talk about these uh, transferaminal ligaments. There's a superior, and Kramer doesn't even get this deep. There's an inferior, um, down here, inferior transferaminal ligament. And we'll look at these more in a second. Um, but there's also the ones I worry about are these intraferaminal ligaments, which some of the new authors who do fresh cadaver studies with, um, with endoscopic surgical techniques where they can meticulously take fat out. This is plugged up with fat, right? So they do incredible dissections, and you can see these attached to the nerve roots, attached to the blood vessels, attached to the sinovertebral nerve. 
Um, so yeah, some patients may look exactly like this, and there's not a lot of wiggle room here. If they get a little bit of stenosis, uh, the nerve can get pinched against one of these ligaments, whereas people without the ligaments, if they get some stenosis growing off this Z joint here, oh, the nerve can push way up here, no problem. So it's kind of uh, it's a good clinical indication. If you have a lot of these things, you won't do good with this lateral type stenosis. All right, there's just some of the structures, structures that can be compressed. We were talking about the function of these, these transforaminal ligaments. And many authors uh, believe that their job is simply to hold the, like the exiting nerve root and the, the segmental arteries and veins and the recurrent meningeal nerve, hold them in their normal places or kind of compartmentalize them. Um, but the reason some people don't have any of them, about half the world doesn't have any and half does, it's kind of a mystery. I, you know, what, what could be the purpose of these things? So it's really a strange thing. And I bet you it is involved in chronic radicular pain, especially following failed surgery a lot. If they'd investigate that more, no one's really done a lot of work on that, though. You can see these if they calcify on CT. Uh, otherwise, you can't see them. On MRI, you can occasionally get lucky, but you have to have thin slices, not four millimeter cuts like most radiology centers do, so they can speed people through the tubes as fast as possible. Uh, and you have to make sure you go out into the far lateral zones or you won't see them. And then the radiologists aren't, don't even know about them. Um, so that's the problem with these things. Uh, Kramer talks about some associated pain syndromes. I haven't reviewed these papers with my own eyes yet, but uh, they've been implicated as a cause of back pain and nerve root entrapment, so radicular pain and back pain. So radicular pain, that means the spinal nerve is being compressed, or if it's already branched into the dorsal and uh, ventral roots, those are compressed. Um, so we understand that, but how in the world can it cause back pain? Right? Aren't those nerves coming out of the holes? Don't those go down your legs? How can they cause back pain? Well, remember, one of them is actually going in the neural foramen, and that's the sinovertebral nerve, uh, a.k.a. recurrent, hence the a.k.a. recurrent meningeal nerve. Uh, and so, yeah, that is that does make sense that it could cause back pain and even sympathetic drive pain. Okay. Uh, so again, if some of the ligaments calcify or thicken abnormally, uh, they could compress an already inflamed nerve root and kind of perpetuate. Uh, maybe they anchor and grab and attach to the nerve root and mess up excursion. When you walk upstairs, uh, those, that spinal nerve has to move and slide, right? It moves a few millimeters. Uh, if it's all tangled up with calcified transforaminal ligaments, Maybe it can't, and you get a tethering injury where it gets yanked. All right, so the other category that Kramer gives us is the corporotransverse ligaments. Um, so remember, this, remember the parent category is accessory intervertebral foramen ligaments, right? So this corpora, as we said, means body. Uh, so the ligament is coursing between the vertebral body, the back corners, and the transverse process. Uh, these are mainly studied at L5-S1, but I assume they're in other places as well. And if these are anomalous, they could compress the artery, the vein, and the gray ramus communicans because they encircle these structures, not so much the exiting, the spinal nerve, or the ventral ramus. All right, uh, and yeah, they've been shown to calcify much more commonly than the transferaminal ligaments, according to Kramer as well. Now, here's a really good paper. I recommend you go out if you're really into this uh, by Zhao, and 2016 paper, and unbelievable work with the dissecting microscope. So we're looking at fresh cadaver, and we're looking from inside the epidural space out the neural foramen. In fact, you can see really nicely, this is the pedicle right here. 
And some of this labeling isn't the greatest with this, like that's not the transverse process there, for goodness sakes. Uh, but the here's the pedicle. Here's how the nerve root wraps around the pedicle in order to exit the hole. The outside world would be going this direction, right? So about 50% of people have this clearly. But look at these things on this, this cadaver, fresh cadaver specimen. Some of these were young, too. Um, yeah, so those are interforaminal ligaments that actually uh, grab the, attach, they anchor the, they don't sandwich the nerve root, the exiting nerve root here. Uh, they actually grab it and they anchor it uh, to various parts of the vertebrae. Um, like here's the disc, one of them anchors right to the disc, one anchors down to the vertebral body, can anchor to the body here, can anchor back to the Z joints over here. Um, here's the ala of the sacrum, this is a, uh, this is the uh, L5S1 shot here. Down here you can see as well, you can see a artery, one of the segmental arteries trapped up here, uh, inside one of these, that's more of an extra foraminal ligament. But you can see the same thing in this other specimen, the same, uh, the same type of deal. Um, so those are interforaminal ligaments, and uh, they got to be clinically important. Look at how thick that is tethered to that nerve root. So there's got to be more research done on this, I believe. Right here's from uh, how Bogduke classifies these. If you want to get like this, would be considered an advanced board question. But if you want to know everything. Uh, if you don't want to know everything, pass the class with a B or C. You don't need to know this stuff, but if you want to crush things, you should know these. Um, so let's go over them. So this is the, there's an inferior and superior, uh, there is a inferior and superior transforaminal ligament. So that's what we talked about before. So the superior transforaminal ligament lives in the superior portion of the inner vertebral foramen, but it bridges between the, uh, it spans or it bridges the inferior vertebral notch between the body, in this case, in the facet joint. The inferior transverse ligament, it is on the bottom part of the inner vertebral foramen, uh, and it spans the superior vertebral notch of the inferior member of the motion segment, right? Because that is the, oh, that beeping, that's the, the spectrum idiot who showed up not to do his job again. The problem is they don't want to go in our attic. We think a, the cable is bad. Uh, the last three of them have not wanted to go up into the attic because that's too much work for them. Anyway, I digress. I probably should cut that out, but I don't think I will cut that out. Don't get spectrum. Anyway, um, so this one's an interesting, look at this one. Uh, so this is called a mid-transforaminal ligament, and it actually is connected to the intervertebral disc. So it spans uh, from the lateral, posterior lateral corner of the intervertebral disc uh, over to the, it should be down here, drawn a little bit better, but it, it goes into the facet joint capsule, two sensitive, two structures that are filled with nociceptors and possibly uh, I mean, maybe yanking on this thing, maybe somehow that is involved with yanking the disc and causing pain. So that, that's a really interesting one. And then we have the corporal transverse ligaments, the inferior and superior members. Uh, so the superior one runs uh, between the vertebral body and the, remember the accessory process of the transverse process? We studied that, that's on your list. Uh, well, now we're going to make some use of it because the superior corporal transverse ligament actually connects into it. It connects the same. Uh, that's what Bogdu goes on and says. These guys, they're not really ligaments, though, are they? Because they don't connect two bones together. None of these are connecting bone to bone to bone. They're, uh, I mean, ligaments stabilize bones together. Uh, the only exception is this inferior corporal transverse ligament, which actually connects the vertebral body corner uh, to the transverse process below. So this one could be considered a true ligament here. All right? But this is the intra uh, ligaments we haven't even talked about. They don't even list these. And that's a whole nother nest of these underneath this, right? Uh, these are all the 
infra, sorry, the infraforaminal ligaments. Uh, so these extraforaminal ones I just showed you are deep. They're deep into the plane of the page. We can't even see them. There might be more of them there. This paper was only looking at these right in the start of the neural foramen, right? And we're, if you're Ant-Man, you're standing in the epidural space with your camera or you're floating. All right, I think that's enough about that. So let's get into the intervertebral disc now. We've talked about it quite a bit, so it should be pretty easy. Uh, so there's the disc. Hopefully you've, you know what that is already. It has a nucleus pulposus. It's corralled by an annulus fibrosus. There's a posterior longitudinal ligament, which is stuck to it back here. I didn't draw the lateral fibers, but there are lateral fibers of that posterior longitudinal ligament as well. Uh, and it is one of the three ligaments of the vertebral body. The annulus fibrosus, the Sharpie's fibers, actually connect vertebral body to, to for deeper bodies, we'll see. Uh, so therefore, it is considered one of the ligaments of the vertebral body. The other two would be the anterior longitudinal ligament and the posterior longitudinal ligament, uh, and then annulus fibrosus. Made of nucleus pulposus and annulus fibrosus. Of course, we said that. Let's dive into this nucleus pulposus. So that, of course, is the center. It's held in place by lamellae. We'll look at those lamellae specifically. Because its cells generate molecules that are really hydrophilic or hydrophilic. They love water. Philic is love, philia. Uh, it's about 80% water, so the center of your di disc is really squishy. Okay, the good thing about uh, the nucleus is that it's corralled, otherwise, that squishy stuff would spit all over the place. Okay. And here it is again. These are the lamellae now. It's about 15 rings of type 1 collagen. Uh, that I think we talked about this, like a steel-belted radio. You tell patients your disc is like a steel-belted radial tire. It's got air, but it's not really air. It's like a toothpaste on the inside. And then just like a tire that has air, the air would get out if, if it wasn't corralled by something. This is corralled by type 1 collagen called lamellae or the annulus fibrosis. We talked all about these already, the sinovertebral nerve, nociceptive fiber here, posterior longitudinal ligament's not drawn, but it's also connected to the fecal sac here. Okay, so since the water can't escape, and because water is incompressible, when you have the weight of your body pushing down on that watery disc, and it can't go anywhere, it turns rock hard, almost like a ball bearing is the best way to think of it. And therefore, you have a ball bearing in the center of your disc, and that's like the pivot point for your trunk motion, bending to the left, bending to the right. Um, yeah. And then what happens if you get a flat tire? Well, that's like getting a grade, a full thickness annular tear where it rips the disc completely. That screws up everything. Well, look how it screws up the pressure within the disc, causes degenerative disc disease. It shifts the pivot point to the posterior, overworks the facets. You get facet disease because of that. Uh, and then the the point where the axial load, the new kind of center, the focal point, is now right over the tear, the posterior annulus. So it grinds on that ripped annulus. All right, so here's a cartoon of that. There's a full thickness tear through the disc. That's called a annular tear or radial annular tear. And the center point here, or that axis where the where the body's movement, that used to be the ball bearing point, biomechanics clearly show it shifts back here over the darn uh, annus or the sinovertebral nerves. And so this is always irritating this stuff. Um, doesn't happen in everybody. Uh, something to do with the the immune system. If the immune system knows who these cells are, you're probably not going to get pain. Most or in some people, the immune system doesn't know. Remember, these started out as nodal cortical cells, and then they changed by the age of 10 years old. You got rid of the nodal cord cells and nucleus pulposus cells, kind of fibroblast-like cells showed up. And since this is avascular, the theory is some people's immune systems don't know who they are. 
And that's okay because there's no blood in here. The immune system can't see them. That's why the immune system doesn't know who they are. But if they get out here where they come in contact with the blood vessels and nerves, now the body's immune system freaks out and thinks it's a virus or something and you get a wicked inflammation. And we know that compression and or inflammation, well, com compression alone can't cause pain. But inflammation alone can cause pain. You don't have to have compression. So they get inflamed and they're going to send signals up to your brain that my back is killing me. So that's kind of the story with that. And then they can leak out. I mean, I'm getting, it's early in the morning. I have too much energy. Uh, but anyway, that's the story. So it shifts the axial load back here. And now it overloads these Z joints, these facet joints, and they wear out prematurely. So not a good thing to have an annular tear, we do believe. Although, important point, they're not always symptomatic. Little embryology of the nucleus pulposus and disc. Remember, I don't know if I've made it to that in embryology yet, but the disc, I don't think we have got that far. <clears throat> uh, the nucleus pulposus is actually the only thing that's left of your nodal cord. I think actually next Monday we'll start talking about the nodal cord. Uh, but yeah, it's the only thing that's left of it. Normally that's left of it. And that forms the nucleus pulposus. And even by the age of 10, that's gone. Uh, but it does form the nucleus pulposus. Uh, sometimes, pathologically, nodal cord doesn't disappear. It can turn into a tumor called chordoma. We'll look at that in embryology. Those are nasty. Um, yeah, and you remember the nodal cord, or you will learn the nodal cord is derived from modified ectodermal cells. So you could say the nucleus pulposus is actually derived from the ectoderm. Or you could even go further back and say it's the epiblast because maybe the, the ectoderm hasn't fully formed yet. It could be ectoderm cells. It really is modified uh, ectoderm cells moving through there. Uh, did I say endoderm? It's not endoderm. This is ectoderm cells. Um, this, but, but it could be epiblast was the precursor of ectoderm cells is my point here. Uh, so it may actually be formed by epiblast cells and not ectoderm. But the board books say ectoderm, so that's what we'll go with. Here's a cartoon of the notochord being formed. Um, so there's the primitive node, the primitive streak, and there's cells migrating up. And they're hitting uh, this kind of stoppage point. The precordial plate stops them, but that's what a nodal cord looks like. And we'll get to that when that time comes. These are epiblast cells. Uh, these are hypoblast cells. They may be in transition. Now they're, this could be ectoderm. This could be endoderm. AVE cells are right here. All right, <clears throat> most of the annulus and nucleus are completely avascular, as we've kind of said already, uh, and they're non-innervated except for that outer lip. <clears throat> so it normally has no blood vessels. It has zero lymph vessels, period. There's not a lymph vessel anywhere, even on the outside of the disc. Uh, and it has no nerves except for that outer circumference. Pretty darn tough environment for if you want to be a cell, this is not the place to want to live. <clears throat> because of this. Um, yeah, so so it causes kind of a, a nutrient-poor environment. I could change that. Let me put that on my list. Change that to nutrient-poor. Oh, that slide 405. Kind of a nutrient, nutrient-poor environment. And yeah, the, the cells are prone to die, and they do die. They actually act naturally age. A lot of them die off as time goes by. But it's really easy to make them prematurely die. When they prematurely die, you got yourself a problem called degenerative disc disease. So now this begs the question, well, cells are living tissue. How do the cells in the deep annulus fibrosis and nucleus pulposus, how do they get food? Right? How do they get food? How do they remove their wastes? Right? Just like cells have metabolism, they make acids. They have to be removed. The answer is diffusion. So the nutrients, the blood nutrients, 
come from the vertebral body. The vertebral body is very innervated, or very, it's innervated too, but it's very vascular. And so the end plates, the bony end plates, some call that subchondral bone, have tons of blood flowing through there. And they have holes in them in the subchondral bone. Uh, those are called marrow channels or marrow cavities. And blood can diffuse easily through those cavities right into the disc. Um, the outer periphery of the disc has arterioles and capillaries and a venous system. Uh, so the outer annulus fibrosis cells, they get fed like normal. But those, the kind of the middle or the inner annulus fibrosis has to be fed and the nucleus has to entirely be fed by diffusion. Right, here's a little cartoon of that. Again, we've seen that, but uh, the outer part of the annulus fibrosis does have blood, arterioles, does have a microcirculation not shown. So the, these cells get fed fine, but we have to get a diffusion in for the to, to feed these cells. But the nucleus and the inner annulus, that's fed by blood vessels from the vertebral body uh, in where the mar I didn't draw the marrow channels here, but there's marrow channels which allow blood to diffuse in. And that's kind of the, the deal. Uh, there's a basivitiba foramen you can see, Hans venus cleft. Um, you can see the hole where this comes in, the artery and vein, and the nerve. There's a basivitibral nerve. I could have drawn the little yellow nerve with all that as well. So how we still haven't really answered the question. Diffusion feeds the disc cells and takes away the waste. But there's something called diurnal change. I think we'll talk about this in upper quarters, but I'll introduce it to you. Uh, diffusion of nutrients is encouraged by something called diurnal change, and it's got to do with pressure inside the nucleus propulsus and inner annulus. So when you sleep at night, you are n you have no axial load on your disc anymore, and a negative pressure occurs within the disc. And that is like, uh, it's kind of like during the day, if you squeeze a sponge, your disc is like a sponge being squeezed, all the water is forced out of it and all the waste is forced out of it. But at night when you take the pressure off the sponge, what does the sponge do? It expands. You actually grow in height that night because of the expansion of the discs and that's called diurnal change. Uh, getting up in the morning, squeezing the sponge, laying down at night, <clears throat> relaxing the sponge. And that kind of slumber causes a sucking force, it's thought, and help <clears throat> helps suck uh, the material back inside or helps feed the disc, helps suck the glucose and nitrogen and oxygen and everything, helps with diffusion flow in. And when you're up during the day, the opposite happens. You get a positive pressure in the disc. You're squeezing the sponge, and the bigger waste products tend to move out that way. So that's the theory, anyway. That's diurnal change. So, getting off topic, but slant boards are quite popular. And although there's no research that shows really any type of treatment can actually help a disc herniation, uh, all everything's pretty much anecdotal. But it makes sense that a slant board, you guys know what a slant board is? So it's a board, here's the, here's the floor right here. It's just a board that's slanted, and it, it varies. You can make it, I always recommend starting out about 15 degrees. Uh, and the human can hang from this board. So here's my wonderful drawings again with my finger. But here's the human, there's the knees. Yeah, and there's they got like little latches, there's your feet. There's like little things that cook your feet in there. And you can like hang out here and read and stuff. That causes a semi-diurnal change. And it makes sense that it's possible that these slant boards could, if you can tolerate it, some patients can't tolerate even this. They're so inflamed they can't tolerate this. But if you can tolerate that, it acts as a mini diurnal change during midday. So it logically makes sense that it could speed the healing of an annular tear. I digress. Uh, but this is just showing you, here's a disc maybe at nighttime or positive pressure in the disc. Uh, but or I'm sorry, at uh, during the daytime where there's positive pressure. At night, uh, when there's a negative pressure in here, you're sucking 
you're sucking nutrients, sucking nutrients into the disk. Just making a note here in 412. Right? And that's the theory, the sponge theory. What can go wrong? Well, the marrow channels can become clogged up. I'm going to make a note. I didn't know marrow channels. I've got the wrong picture in there. I had it showed marrow channels on one. Uh, but, yeah, these marrow channels can get clogged up uh, with it's really common for the vertebral end plates to become sclerotic, full of arthritis, full of extra bone growth, and it clogs those channels, and that cuts off the feeding supply of the disc. And that's going to doom the disc to degeneration if that happens. Then all you have is the blood around the periphery of the disc to try to supply the nucleus, and that ain't going to happen. Okay. When the disc dies, when the disc cells start to die, they stop making uh, glycosaminoglycans and proteoglycans stop forming, and there goes your water content. So as the disc dies, it becomes dry and brittle. It looks black on T2-weighted MRI. You can see these quite nicely. doesn't always mean the patient's going to have pain, uh, but there definitely increased risk for developing chronic back pain when you have a black disc like that. Yeah, because the brittle disc is amenable to annular tear. And sometimes the tear can give birth to a herniation. And the facet joints, joints get overloaded, and they be, can become arthritic, and you, they can be a source of chronic pain. Right? Here's a cartoon. There's an overhead cut through the disc again. There's a normal healthy disc. Uh, normally there's 15 lamellae here, of course. Uh, and yeah, here is a disc that's completely ripped through, and the disc is, these cells are dead. I, made, I guess it could have made it like black or something, a kind of a dead-looking color. Uh, <clears throat> but nevertheless, it's pink to show up. And here's an annular tear, so that in and of itself can cause pain, but this is one a step further. The nucleus propulsus is actually pushing right out. It's herniating out the tear. The, the annular tear gave birth to the her, the the herniation here. And it's irritating uh, the nerve roots here, whether it be, this is a double nerve root kind of thing. You don't have this setup usually. Uh, usually you have an exiting root and a transversing root. We'll just call these the S. If this is L5, uh, these are the L5 exiting roots. These would be the S1 roots. Those would be the S2, 3, 4, 5. It's kind of off a little bit. But nevertheless, it's irritating the nerve roots. And so patients... Uh, have inflammation. Some people can have these, about 30% of people have these small contained, see that it's contained because the posterior longitudinal ligament hasn't ripped yet, the blue is still there. Small contained protrusion, these are called. So 30% of people have these without any pain. The key is, is whether or not there's a leaking going on. If the cytokines are, if the degenerated Degenerative cells release inflammatory molecules called cytokines, so this becomes filled with these cytokines, which are like gasoline. If this gets soaked with these cytokines, especially one called tumor necrosis factor alpha, uh, really bad deal. Uh, it, it will You'll have sciatica for sure. You'll have radicular pain and probably radiculopathy. All right, I'm, getting, I'm not teaching that class anymore, so I'll let the people above teach that class. How can you see the disc and the nucleus? Can't see it on radiographs. You can see a disc space. You can see a disc space. Um, so you can see the disc height. Usually when the disc is disc height is reduced, when you do an MRI, that disc will be black because it will be degenerated. So a decreased disc height is a, is a cause or is a sign, a strong sign of degenerative disc disease in progress. You can only see intervertebral disc on uh, a, uh, well, that's not true. You can see a disc on a T1, a proton density, a fat sat. There's all kinds of MRI images. T2 is the best one to see the intervertebral disc on, though. You can see it on CT as well, but not nearly as well. It's magnified. It's hard to judge with these, but you can see it. So here is a disc. Right, this is a T2 weighted MRI because T2 weighting shows up anything with water as bright white or white. The more white uh, the color, the more water content there is. 
So we can see the nucleus pulposus has high water in this pretty healthy disc, surrounded by an annulus fibrosus. Might be a little annular tear in this person. I can't. This is a patient from back to 2016. Could be an annular tear right there. Uh, those are called concentric annular tears. Uh, but all in all, it looks pretty good. Uh, and we can see how come this is so white here. Well, this is the thecal sac right here. Those are the nerve roots in the thecal sac, right? So that makes up the cauticoina, but these are called traversing nerve roots. The exiting nerve root is right here. If this is L4, that's the L4 exiting root. And these, these will be the L5 traversing roots. The ones that are getting ready to bud off the thecal sac come up to the corners here. And these other guys just hang out back here. But the point is white, super white, because cerebrospinal fluid has way more water content than nucleus propulsus, so it's whiter. Fat has a high water content. This is epidural fat here. Facet joints. Too much energy today. <clears throat> I won't by the end of the day. Got a little behind in my lectures. <clears throat> Because of, did I mention, don't ever buy charter cable. That's Spectrum, a.k.a. I think I did mention that. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> so hydrostatic pressure. This is a great little cartoon here. There's the nucleus propulsus. Axial load pushing down on it. The water's trying to get out. The annulus is saying, no way, you're not going anywhere. And it turns rock hard here into a ball bearing. Um, this hydrostatic pressure is actually really important. The cells actually love hydrostatic pressure. They love to be compressed like this. And they spit out their products, their proteoglycans and their glycosaminoglycans. They make their stuff. They thrive on pressure. Same with the annulus fibrosis cells. Uh, but if you take that away, if you're bedridden, or if you have an annular tear, it, it decreases the hydrostatic pressure because you've made a bigger space. If we have a tear in here now, there's a bigger volume. And so that's another way that it makes the disc cells, they're not happy and they don't secrete their glycosaminoglycans. And so they, they don't, the disc starts to dry out. It's amenable to more tears. Right? Everything I said, having high hydrostatic intradiscal pressure stimulates the disc cells to perform properly. They need pressure to be happy, right? And they produce glycosaminoglycans. We're going to really look at this more closely here in a little bit. Decreased hydrostatic pressure, as I said, that will make the disc, it'll inhibit the disc from making cells. It dries out and it's amenable to ripping uh, and disc herniation and facet joint de degeneration if it rips, right? Everything I kind of already said here. Uh, what decreases hydrostatic pressure within the disc? An annular tear. Annular tears are important. What about the histology? I haven't been watching my time, so I have no idea uh, where I am. Let me take a check here. Started at 360, went through 40. 60, we can go a little bit further. And then we'll call it a day. Um, so histology of the nucleus pulposus. So as we, I kind of already told you this, when you're born, you're born with notochordal cells, right? By about the age of 10, those morph into a new kind of fibroblast, chondrocyte-like cell, I guess is what they are calling it. Some authors call them fibroblast-likes. Some call them chondrocytes, but we'll go with chondrocytes here. Uh, and what do they secrete? What is, what is the job of a cell? Cell has to make products to spit out into the uh, into the ground substance, into the interstitium. Uh, well, they make type two nucleus pulposus cells make type two collagen. It's an easy board question. Type two collagen is softer. Uh, it's more amenable to this this situation. But annulus fibrosis, those are more like fibroblast-like cells. Uh, those make type 1 collagen. They make lamellae, which form into lamellae. So nucleus pulposus cells, type 2 collagen. Annulus fibrosis cells, type 1 collagen. You should know that. They also make the ground substance. I mean, really, the ground substance is just created by the production of another thing cells make, the glycosaminoglycans. Ground substance is everything that the cell sits in except for collagen and, and um, elastic fiber. That's what the ground substance is in a nutshell. 
So everything I said, it's colorless. It's like a jello, colorless jello. The cells sit in it. Consider it the interstitium because that's what nutrients dumped out by microcirculation have to diffuse. I call it swim, but you, you diffuse through that stuff. Kind of. <clears throat> And the nucleus pulposus, it has the consistency of toothpaste. We said already it's about 80% water in the nucleus pulposus. very slippery. Glycosaminoglycans are super slippery. Um, gags are, these glycosaminoglycans are called gags. The gags are in, in your all joints of the body where their synovial fluid uh, makes these things. And they're slippery. They help bones slide over each other. So important stuff. Shall we get into the annulus? Yeah, well, we'll, we'll get into the annulus too. Because we kind of talked about it. It corrals the nucleus in place. Uh, it's made up of 15 sheets of collagen called lamellae. So I've said that several times. I don't think I, it's in stone, but now it's testable. Uh, the inner ones, not all of them, not the outer ones, but the inner ones actually pass through the vertebral implate, specifically the cartilaginous vertebral implates and they completely encircle the nucleus. Here's a great picture of a nucleus pulposus. Here's the cartilaginous implates. Here's the bony implates. That would be the inferior bony implate and that's the cartilaginous implate. And you can see how the lamella in reality of course it's really squished together, right? This is just a cartoon just to show you. Uh, but the the inner lamellae go right through. And so that literally corrals the nucleus pulposus completely. On the outer part, the the cartilaginous or these uh, cartilaginous vertebral implants, they don't go all the way out. They stop. And there's a rim of bone here called the ring apothesis. I think it was on your lab drawings, the ring apothesis. So the lamellae and the outer part this is the true ligament, the intervertebral ligament of the intervertebral disc is really these outer, far, uh, outer lamellae fibers. They have a name. They're called Sharpie's fibers. Sharpie's fibers do not encircle the nucleus pulposus. Okay, do lamellae really, if you want to get technical, do they really completely encircle the disc? No. About 40 of, well, most of them do. Most of them completely go around the disc. Uh, but 40% of them are incomplete. They fail to completely encircle the disc. And that leaves weak spot. And unfortunately, the place where they are, they don't meet up are the posterior lateral corners of the disc. And that's where herniations occur. Uh, so 50% of them are actually com incomplete in the posterior lateral uh, component of the annulus fibrosis. So that's even worse. So that's another reason why herniations occur in the posterior lateral part of the disc in the epidural space in an area called the paracentral zone. Paracentral disc herniations are by far the most common. Here's a really good picture of this. Uh, and we can see some lamellae here. These lamellae are completely going around. Awesome. All the way around the front. But look at these lamellae. They didn't, all of a sudden they just petered out. That's it. They stopped. So that's an incomplete lamellae. And the other lamellae happened to be going at the same time. But you just created a weak spot right here. So if you have a torsion injury to the spine or any kind of other injury, this and this gets overpressurized, it's tend to go out through where these uh, failure to connects are. And they happen to be in this posterior lateral corner here. Okay, another flaw. Unfortunately, if that's not bad enough, the thickness of the annulus of the lamellae uh, is not thick, as thick as the front in the posterior part of the disc. And that's where we need it to be thick because the traversing nerve roots of the corticoiner are right next to it. Uh, so that's kind of a committee design flaw, I would say. Um, yeah, and the thick the and the the anterior annulus we don't really care about because there's no nerves in the anterior annulus to feel anything. Uh, there's sympathetic afferents, but those are thought not to really be much of a source of pain. 
Okay, um, yeah, another, why, another reason disc herniations occur. And then if you really want to get technical, they have this cool design. So the committee did good here for the ones that do completely go around. Uh, each, each lamella, each band of the steel belt or radiated tire, uh, tire, each belt has its type 1 collagen fibers running in a certain direction. Specifically, if you drop a vertical down, it's running 65 degrees exactly from that vertical axis. So they're all running in this oblique fashion. But the next layer is running negative 65 degrees. So you get this kind of crisscross pattern here, uh, which gives things extra strength. Here's a better blow up of that. See how that is? I think that's called, there's like an orthodromic design, or there was a word for that. I can, can't remember. It's getting too deep into mechanics. But there's other places in the, in the body that you'll see this kind of layered design. I don't think it's to 65 degrees like it is in the lamella here. But um, So yeah, that's a good medium-hard question. All right, little histology. So as we said, the annulus fibrosis is mainly type 1 collagen. Uh, remember, nucleus is type 2 collagen, and uh, it can covalently and electrostatically bind with proteoglycan. So there is proteoglycan within the annulus fibrosis, not nearly as much, though. There's other types of collagen, type 2, 4. Uh, type 6 collagens are being studied with regard to degenerative disc disease. Uh, but there's other, uh, well, we, we know there's type 2, but there's type 5 and type 6 are also in the annulus fibrosis. And now let's get into the third component of the disc, the vertebral end plates. I think actually this is where I'm scheduled to stop. So we'll stop right here. Let me write down stop 432. And let's keep our fingers that Camtasia has been acting up. I had to do three takes on a, your spinal anatomy. Yesterday was a disaster. One was the leaf blower debacle. Um, but anyway, okay, everybody, fingers crossed again. We'll see you next week. Don't forget, next week, week five, we have our lab test. Since we're shelter in place has been extended now through the month of May, uh, it will be online. So it'll just be probably 20 questions uh, coming right from your lab slides. Actually, it'll be 20 pictures coming right from your, I don't, there will be no questions on your Spinal anatomy. It'll just be 20 pictures of identify structures. Multiple choice format. Okay, see you later.